Good afternoon. I have instructions to speak slowly, so I will, I will try to continue um, as slowly as possible. Um, good afternoon, and we're very excited and, and pleased to be here, so thank you very much for inviting us. I'm afraid only this slide is in Spanish, so and, and that is as much as my Spanish um, is. I'm I'm very sorry. So, um, and as as I understand, there will be subtitles after. So hopefully, you'll be able to pick up a few more points after today's session. So I'm Carol, uh, Caroline, and this is my colleague Carol. Carol and Caroline, very confusing. Um, we both answer to both, so don't you know? Don't worry if you get it confused. So what we will cover um, during this session, we, we're going to um, speak for about 40 minutes and then allow time for some questions and further discussion after that, if you have if you have any for us. So what we will cover a little bit about who we are and why it, it is us sitting here today. Um, and then we're moving on to the UK legislation in this area. So um, a little bit of background and then to see where, where our journey has taken, taken us up to um, today. A little bit about reasonable adjustments in the UK, the duty that we have in relation to reasonable adjustments and that I know that you have forthcoming. So we'll be able to make some comparisons there. A little bit about the research and measuring that's been done in the UK to see what in, you know how how things have progressed and what's worked and what what perhaps hasn't worked. Um, a bit about our professional support um, that we have, in particular in relation to um, inclusive design and disability access funding streams that we have to promote improvements and lessons that we think we can learn and hopefully you can um, take some of those forward in, in your work. So as I say we'll, we'll do some presentation of slides and then there'll be time for questions and discussion at the end of the session as well. So a little bit about who we are. Um, Carol and I run a, an access consultancy business in the UK. Um, our background is, has been, it was originally as town planners. Um, however, we've um, worked in the inclusive design field myself for um, around um, 20 years and Carol, I don't think she really wants to say, but a little, a little longer. Um, we're based in Wales and we work throughout the UK and also um, in, in Europe or, and on European standards as well. And we know, we know a, a gentleman, a face in the front who, who Carol is also working with. Um, just a bit about um, our experience and um, the networks that we're involved with in the UK. Um, we'll come back to later on the National Register of Access Consultants so I won't say anything much about that other than that, than that is our professional body that we work, um, the, our level of professional competence if you like that we work within and I'll, I'll come back and, and describe that a little bit later. Um, we're members of the Access Association which is um, an organisation of individuals working within the access field who come together and um, under this this association. BRIAM, B R E A M, is the sustainability BRIAM is the sustainability credentials, and we obviously think that there's a really strong link between the principles of sustainability and inclusion and they work quite well hand in, in hand together. 
we're um, members of the consumer and public interest network so we represent consumers within BSI which is the British Standards Institute so we work on and we're currently working on a revision of the British standard relating to access and um, of buildings and also a new standard on pedestrian environments as well and external environments. Um, we're built environment experts at the Design Council and more recently we've become senior associates at the Dementia Services Development Centre at the University of Stirling. Um, so we're, we're increasing our, our knowledge and work in the area of ageing and dementia. So. That's, that's enough about us. Oh no, I have one more slide about us. Um, what we do, so we, we provide design and management solutions advice to our clients, to our customers on both new and existing environments. And that can be anything from a public building um, through to housing, com um, transport environments and also pedestrian environments. We do that in lots of different ways. Um, and just to give you a flavour of the type of work that we do, we run a lot of training courses, whether that be with a, a group of architects or with um, a disability group, giving them advice on what the design standards are in relation to access. It might be through carrying out an audit of an existing building and making recommendations for improving that building. It might be as part of a design team, so a new build development, we would be um, carrying out a plan appraisal and working alongside the architect to provide advice on design standards in relation to accessibility stakeholder engagement with um, between customers and clients um, we work a lot in policy and research really pushing the boundaries and the standards as, as much as possible in relation to accessibility and then as a result of that writing some design and technical guidance pub publications so that is now enough about us. Um, we're going to move on to talk about the legislation and how, how the UK system works. But just, and I, and I know we had this conversation earlier today, obviously one of the other things that we do is promote the economic benefits of improving accessibility with our clients. So in the UK, disabled adults have an annual spending power of 80 billion pounds and that makes obvious commercial sense as to why you should be improving accessibility to your buildings and not only because um, that individual disabled person is likely to come with friends and family and the additional revenue that comes with a group of people who would be attending your cafe, your, your cinema, your restaurant, whatever the service was that you were providing. Um, and it, the survey that um, provided these figures also came up with the, the, the fact that 82% of disabled customers took their business to, to a more accessible competitor so um, it makes obvious economical sense. So I'm just going to start um, briefly looking at our legislation now. Um, which started off as, and I'm already using an acronym here, I'm sorry, DDA, which is Disability Discrimination Act. So our Disability Discrimination Act was introduced back in 1995. Um, and there were lots of different sections to that act, um, some dealing with employment, others with education, transport, um, but the part in particular that we're interested in today um, in relation to buildings access and, and access to housing is, is the one that's called access to goods and services. So there was a specific section that dealt with access to goods and services. The timeline of the Act coming into force, so the Act was introduced in 1995 um, and then 
in at different stages along the timeline, different um, requirements came in, into place in relation to service providers. So, um, first of all, service providers had a general duty not to discriminate against a disabled person. So, that would be blatant refusal perhaps of your service to a disabled person that was not that in 1996 became unlawful in 1999 we had the introduction of a second stage which was that you had to change policies practices and procedures that would discriminate against a disabled person an example of that might be for ex for example that you had a policy in place that said no dogs were allowed on in this premises but in 99 you'd had to have the policy no dogs except assistance dogs um, or that you might have to provide an auxiliary aid that might help that help an individual so for example um, you might have to provide an induction loop system in a meeting venue or at a reception counter an induction loop just just in case a few people were unsure is um the sound system that helps to link with the he hearing aid of a hearing impaired person and um, allows better communication so it's not a physical feature as such although although it can be built into the environment it's an auxiliary aid as well so things like that if it was reasonable to do so things like that would be built in in 99 the key date and the date that you're soon to see here in Spain for us was a change to physical features of buildings and that came in in 2004 for us um, and at that time um, service providers had to make reasonable adjustments to their buildings so that physical features were no longer a barrier. Um, since 2004 our legislation has evolved into and we now have the Equality Act which brought together all strands of um, different types of discrimination so disability, race, gender, um, sexual orientation were all brought together into a single act and we now have the Equality Act however the requirements in relation to disability remain the same so I've mentioned the word reasonable and that you have to, what you have to make changes that are reasonable um, and I'm going to pass to Carol now to talk a little bit more about that okay thanks Caroline can everyone hear me okay yeah I too will try to speak slowly please signal if I start speeding up it is a characteristic of the Welsh that we, and we are Welsh, not English, it's a characteristic of the Welsh that we do tend to speed up um, as time goes on. Okay, so Caroline mentioned with the, the legislation, with the, the Disability Discrimination Act and now the Equality Act, it's all about making reasonable adjustments. And the, obviously the, the key question there is, well, what is reasonable? Um, we're still asking that, and it's it's basically keeping solicitors, I, you know, in jobs, um, working out what is reasonable because it's a matter for the courts to decide quite often. Um, the duty to make reasonable adjustments comes into place if a disabled person is placed at a st substantial disadvantage by something that an organisation is doing. Um, in the way in which they provide their service or their physical premises. Now, in terms of what is reasonable um, to make alterations to your physical premises, that might depend on what's practical to do. It may depend on um, the size of the organisation and the resources available to that organisation. For instance, your corner shop wouldn't be expected to make the same scale of changes as a, a major retail store. Um, so it is taken into consideration whether a change is, is uh, a, an alteration, a, a physical feature, is, is realistic to expect. Um, but that doesn't mean the small store doesn't do anything. 
they are expected to do whatever they can. Um, they also take into account, you know, the reasonableness of the change that would be needed and the cost of making that change. Um, you know, for instance, um, if the only way of gaining access was via a lift and it was quite a small building and the lift was going to cost a lot of money, that might be something you put in the budget for quite some time ahead. But it might be you make other alterations. Um, it may be you make sure that on the ground floor, there's all the services you know um, uh, that, that people might be needing, and they're repeated on the upper floor rather than having some unique features on the upper floor. So there's different ways of doing it, um, and also taking into account you know if if the organisation or the building has already had some changes made, even if they're not perfect. Um, that might um, help them. So, the requirement um, in terms of physical features is either to remove a physical feature if it causes a barrier, to change it, or to provide a, a way of avoiding the physical feature. So it might well be that you, you leave a set of steps but you provide another ramp um, but it has to be where it's reasonable to do so and reasonable for the um, disabled person using it as well providing an alternative entrance round the back by the bins is not reasonable and um, so it has to be an equivalent entrance and the sorts of adjustments that, that were made to existing premises were things like um, particularly in the beginning and very much focused on providing ramps and lifts, making doorways wider or automated. And then it developed a little bit more in, in terms of providing much more features along the lines of better lighting, more signage and you know, contrast in the decorations and design, so much more um, sophisticated changes there. The duty that came in, and um, we were talking earlier um, with with some of you at lunchtime about the way in which your own legislation is, is coming in and you have a sort of date in, in mind, a deadline where, by which you should be making physical access. Um, we too had that date back in 2004 and everyone had to provide for it. And the, the duties on service providers um, were very much preparatory and anticipatory. So service providers were expected to prepare. They were expected to at least have in place, have done an audit and know what access barriers there were, to have started a plan at least of making adjustments, train their staff, and then as they make improvements, let people know, let disabled people know that they are making them. We had no end of calls to say, well, we've made it accessible and nobody comes. Well, does anyone know? It's been accessible for the last 50 years. Does anyone know that it's changed? You've got to let people know that, that it's happening. Anticipatory means that you have to be proactive as a service provider. So it's no point waiting until somebody complains they can't get into your building. It's too late then. You should have proactively considered what barriers there might be to people getting in um, or to getting around the building and done something about it. And it's also a continuing and evolving duty. It's not enough to do it once and forget about it. Um, you have to monitor any changes that are made and see, you know, are they working? Are they doing what you hoped they would be doing? Is there more that can be done? And also thinking about technology there are there's some access barriers that become extremely difficult to solve. But maybe a year or two down the line, there'll be some technology advance that might make it a little bit easier to do it. So you have to keep revisiting um, accessibility. In terms of what is um, reasonable, all that the actual Act says, the, the Disability Discrimination Act, when that came in, and now the Equality Act, is you need to provide reasonable access to, to your service. 
and through that to your premises. So the guidance has evolved um, around that and it is referred to in terms of having to use good practice and best practice in looking at things. So that comes, broadly speaking, in three main strands, but there are others. Um, in terms of planning, and, and all development, or almost all development, is required to have planning permission, um, then inclusive design is very much promoted through planning policy and has to be taken into account in any planning application. The detail comes in at the building regulation stage, which deals with inside the building. Now, building regulations apply to all new construction and to um, most renovations and extensions. So if you are constructing something new or you're changing your existing building, then you have to provide a reasonable level of access. And the building regulations are written um, in the UK, and I understand there's been a recent change towards this in Spain, as functional requirements. So all that the building regulations actually requires is reasonable access to, into, around, and to sanitary facilities. That, that's all the building regulation says about accessibility. Then they publish an approved document. Now that wasn't published when building regulations first introduced access. We just had the functional requirements. And the ones who were most concerned about the lack of guidance were the professionals trying to implement this. The building control officers and so on. Um, and started writing their own professional guidance. Now the government had said we wouldn't provide guidance because architects and designers would consider that would be stepping on, on their, you know, sort of artistic um, designs, that they should be free and flexible to do access the way they wanted. And yet, it was the professions who actually called and said, we can't have this vacuum. Who knows when a lift is meant to be provided? Is it reasonable to always provide a lift, no matter how small the upper floor? Um, what is reasonable? So then the government did produce an approved document, but it's only one way of providing the access and making the solutions. Um, alternative ways are also allowable, providing they are equivalent or better um, than, than what's in that. If a building newly built is built to the standard of Part M, then they are exempt from any action being taken under the Disability Discrimination Act an individual disabled person saying, I don't like that about the building, it's not accessible. Um, any feature that is covered by Part M has a 10 year exemption so that um, the building owner can't sort of have to go through two different hoops. And finally, we have the British standards. Now, these are very much guidance. There is absolutely no compulsion to follow a British standard unless it is referred to either in legislation or more and more in client requirements. So they would require being met to the British standard. The British standard is very much hand in hand with the approved document M. There is very little, um, well there's, there isn't any, any substantial difference between their requirements. The British standard has a lot more information and a lot more detail um, on, on issues. So that's sort of it in a nutshell. I could also say that approved document M, as well as covering phys uh, public buildings, also has a section covering dwellings. We won't um, dwell on that t today, but um, there is a requirement that all new housing, um, there's been a requirement for several years that all new housing meets a lifetime home standard. That requirement is now changing um, so that the local authority now has to um, show the demand that would be in place in their area for both um, lifetime homes type housing, which are easily adaptable um, so that they can um, 
easily be adapted if uh, somebody in there is disabled or becomes older or has children and prams and so on. But also, if they can justify a certain amount of wheelchair housing, then they has to be provided as well. So that's quite new, and we're still waiting to see how that works out. So that's sort of, in a nutshell, um, what is the requirement is. Caroline's now going to look at what happens if they don't do it. What happens in terms of enforcement? So if a service provider does not make a reasonable adjustment, in, in, if a disabled person feels that they have been discriminated against under the legislation um, and feels that, that there is a case for unlawful discrimination, then they have to go through the, the legal system in order to take a case. So the, obviously the first steps would be to raise a complaint and hopefully that will be settled through conciliation between the two parties. But very often there's disagreement about what constitutes reasonableness. Um, and therefore it has, there have been a, a few cases, quite a lot of cases that have been taken to a court of law and even to the House of, uh, even to, to um, um, judicial, judicial review as well, where a public authority has been um, has been has been challenged in their in the decisions that they've made. And I'll just give you a couple of examples of those. Um, very often, cases were taken so that they would perhaps fill gaps in understanding what what reasonable would be in a certain situation so one case was of um was against a bank a high street bank which was rbs royal bank of scotland and they were um, they were providing their business from a an historic building a listed building which had step access into the the premises and they deemed that it would not be reasonable to change that access, provide a ramp or a lift or an alternative way of accessing that premises. Um, so they conducted their business with um, this gentleman, a, a wheelchair user on the street. Um, and thought that that was reasonable to do. Um, and obviously um, that, that was in his eyes not reasonable and took a case and won that and the judge deemed that RBS, a big, a very large bank with a lot of financial resources, could have made changes to that premises and should have made changes to that premises. And just another case, another example of a case where, um, and this is more in terms of not making huge physical changes to a building, but actually just changing a policy or a procedure and providing an auxiliary aid to a customer that will help access that service. So it doesn't always mean huge financial cost. Um, this lady with arthritis um, was told that she would have to wait at an airport because her flight was delayed and um, only needed a chair to rest upon and the um, travel company did not provide that facility for her and therefore she, she won her case that that was obviously unreasonable. Um, and the, the court actually said that it is common, it should actually be common humanity to provide a chair in that situation. So, um, cases being won, have, cases have been won against quite large organisations. 
sometimes people have also challenged the actions of public bodies who have an additional duty under our legislation that they should be taking it one step further because they're providing a public service they should really be leading the way in terms of accessibility so they have an additional duty to show how their work impacts upon um, disabled people and disability equality so um, a particular case was taken just an example of one um, which which really set a precedent if you like in the UK um, an individual took a case against a London borough so a local authority in London was challenged that they hadn't followed the national guidance in terms of tactile paving surfaces. So we have guidance on tactile paving surfaces that should be followed nationally across the UK. And the London Borough decided that they would do something a little bit different. Um, and it was found that they shouldn't have departed from that national guidance. And what this case did was, was give more um, power, if you like, more impetus that people should follow the best practice guidance when they're determining what is reasonable under the Act. That the national guidance has a lot of research sitting behind it, that it's not just been plucked out of the air and somebody has thought that might be a good idea to do. So that was a, a, a case that really set a precedent about following national guidance. So, um, how successful has the legislation been in terms of accessibility to our buildings um, in the UK? Um, probably the best measurement of how successful it's been has been the, the perception of disabled people and whether they feel there is now much more access. I mean, certainly, I think any look around any of our particularly our cities um, many many buildings have been improved um, Caroline talked about a listed building earlier and there has been a lot of guidance given out through the English Heritage Society and others who whose role is to promote um, conserving listed buildings and our historic architecture that you can do that and provide a good level of access so you know there's, there's certainly been a lot of improvements we can talk about anecdotally um, but you know little research on that um, in 2004 when the requirement to have physical features accessible was introduced Caroline and I were actually commissioned by the Disability Rights Commission the body that was promoting the Disability Discrimination Act to carry out some benchmarking research and working with local disability groups in half a dozen towns and cities throughout uh, the UK um, looked at what the sort of stance was at, at that time, how many of the local public and commercial buildings were accessible, um, interviewing disabled people and finding out how accessible they found their sort of daily lives. That was meant to have been and would have been very useful if it had been um, followed up every so often. Unfortunately the Disability Rights Commission disappeared into the um, larger Equality and Human Rights Commission and the focus on that sort of thing um, was, was, was diminished a little. So it was never repeated. So we've looked at uh, other pieces of research or other um, surveys and, and so on that, that have been carried out to see what the, the views are in terms of the Disability Discrimination Act. I mean, we're now 20 years since it first came in in 1995 and much of it was introduced. Um, an organisation called The Really Useful Staff um, they undertook a survey in um, 2013 called Missing Out and they were looking, um, interviewed, they interviewed 350 disabled people 
to talk to them about, in the last five years, has access to Britain's High Street, the, the retails, the shops, has that improved for you? And nearly half um, said it hadn't, that they were still dissatisfied. Or there might have been some improvements, but not enough, that they're still, their daily visit to a, 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 the High Street and most of their retail stores still don't provide a good level of access. I have to say at the same time, our expectations have risen hugely. And so that doesn't mean that nothing's been done since 1995. It's just that disabled people now, out and about, quite rightly, have higher expectations of what to expect and what to complain about. So you have to take that into account as well in any piece of research like that. Looking at levels of, of satisfaction, and this is something that um, people were sort of asked about over the years, how satisfied are you that the Disability Discrimination Act and latterly the Equality Act is working? And at the very beginning in 1995, there had been such huge hopes for this. People had campaigned for many years to have a Disability Discrimination Act and I think were quite disappointed by what actually came in into the legislation and it didn't go far enough according to a lot of disability groups. So there was quite a low level of satisfaction. As it started to be implemented, satisfaction rose, and we had a position when the Disability Rights Commission was created and funded by the government to promote um, the, the, uh, the need for disability equality. And, you know, there was quite good levels of satisfaction there. And um, satisfaction then slowly came down and you had um, times through 2004 again which had been waiting for with physical features when it actually arrived um, people weren't that satisfied with, with what actually happened on the ground um, in 2012 we had the Paralympics and that caused a little bit of a blip in that you know, satisfaction levels stop going down quite so steeply um, because there's a lot of focus then on how good accessibility um, actually was in some of our cities. Um, but since then, it's continued to go down. So, you know, I think it would take a um, another injection of promotion and, and so on to, to, to make that rise again. Um, so interesting to look through that. Some of the examples of some of the responses in the survey that work that uh, the Really Useful Stuff organisation did. Um, one customer said, in my bank the low level counter is frequently out of order, so I have to manage at the high counter and the route to it is crowded with brochures and stands and so on. Well. No one else has ever complained, was their defence when I pointed out their lack of access, so they're not taken seriously. And then another one says, when I said I wanted the loop, as in an induction loop for hearing impaired, and Caroline's explained, they thought I was asking for the loo, or the toilet as we know it in the UK, the loo. They had no idea what a loop was, in spite of the fact that by the side of them was the label for an induction loop on the counter. So, you know, there is still a long way to go. I mean, those might well be odd little cases we've picked out. In many other places, there are really good levels of access, I have to say. But there are still situations like this that people have to encounter. There's currently, or last year, there was a House of Lords inquiry, House of Lords being part of our Parliament, and, and the, uh, that inquiry was on the Equality Act of 2010, the impact on disabled people. And they have an inquiry where they will, ministers and, and so on, will have um, different people come in and give evidence. They'll call for written evidence from anyone who wants to give it. 
And that concluded that the government is failing in its duty of care to disabled people and that practice in all areas must be improved. However, when most of the complaints were about how reasonable adjustments were interpreted and what the word reasonable meant, they then said, we've carefully considered that and we've decided that the flexibility of having reasonable adjustments um, means that we're going to keep it and it's necessary for their effectiveness. So there isn't any easy solution or change to that. And currently, um, another uh, piece of uh, work that we're watching, there's currently at the other part of Parliament, the House of Commons, um, a parliamentary call for evidence um, on an inquiry into the inaccessibility of our homes, buildings and public spaces. And that's something that's going on at the moment. You know, again, looking, as I've said, doesn't mean there hasn't been huge improvements, but there is still um, a lot more to be done. It's going to take longer than um, the sort of 10 or 20 years. And the other piece of legislation that you will also have in Spain um, that, really speaking, didn't have much impact, I think, when it first came in, but more and more um, people are starting to pay regard to, and that's the uh, UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with a Disability. And there's currently, or, um, there's currently a call for evidence out in order to produce um, a report in 2017 um, and that that report will look at how well the, the UK government is doing at promoting um, to save people's rights and at pro protecting and ensuring it themselves in their own services they provide and promoting it for others to do and um, look at the effectiveness of the law and the policies so that'll be quite interesting coming out next year okay the other success perhaps that's happened as you know in terms of um the the changes since the laws were introduced um are some of the changes around the professions and caroline would take us through that so just to bring this all together now, and this is at the, la the just the last few slides that we have for you, um, we thought we'd go through some things that have helped us in the UK in terms of um, implementing the legislation, um, and also some lessons perhaps that we've learned. So things that have helped have been that a body, um, government had funded the National Register of Access Consultants. So we have a professional body that um, ensures that anyone providing advice on accessibility in a professional capacity um, meets minimum standards, meets minimum criteria. So. Um, when in 2004 our duties were introduced a lot of people decided that they would be able to provide advice in this area and saw an opportunity to do that um, whereas they weren't necessarily qualified to do so so this body the national register of access consultants was set up to ensure that that professional competency and that has certainly helped ensure that the quality is met in, in, in design and, and in, in buildings going forward. When we had the Olympic and Paralympic Games in London in 2012, um, the accessibility was a key theme in developing the Olympic Village and the residences that, is, that were associated with that. And there was a real impetus to take that forward and continue that legacy. Um, and so the government decided that it would set up the Built Environment Professional Education Project. And that was um, to encourage all of the built environment professions to, um, in, 
to include inclusive design within their undergraduate schemes so that all new architects coming through, engineers, town planners, building control professionals, whoever it might be. And there's a whole series of, I think, around 20 plus bodies that have now signed up to say that they will include modules and training on inclusive design to their undergraduates as they move through the universities. So that will, so that our future designers will, will, will think that that is standard, that it's not something additional that needs to be considered. We also have um, successes, particularly where funding is related to a project, because by, by getting this funding, a requirement is that that project includes a accessibility and minimum levels of accessibility. So um, it's successful not just because there's a, a nice pot of money involved, but that there is a requirement in that to include an access consultant and to meet certain standards and to have an access audit of that premises undertaken. So in arts, buildings, heritage and sports we often see that they do particularly well in relation to accessibility. And finally, um, some lessons that we think we, we, we have learnt um, that the link between the legislation and the standards is key, really. So we have mention of our building regulations, of British standards within some of our codes of practice. So there are tenuous links, uh, but our case law has now proved that that link is actually a strong one and and that there is a level that is expected to be followed as a minimum at least that in that enforce another lesson that enforcement is a particularly difficult area because it is up to an individual to take a case and the and that's not good enough really that there needs to be some different systems so something that you can take away is that the you know and it's something that the UK is still working on that something different needs to happen in terms of how cases how people are upheld in relation to what is reasonable under the act because there's too much pressure on individuals and that's certainly a drawback and that professional support in this area is key so very early on we had a lot of architects saying yes i do accessibility and what they meant was yes i know how to draw a ramp and put a lift in but they didn't necessarily recognize all the detailed technical implement implementation that was necessary so things like um access in relation to vision loss, so colour contrasts and um, acoustics for hearing impairment and lighting and signage and wayfinding and all the, the, the detail that comes with making sure that a building is accessible. It's not just about ramps and lifts, that it's much more than that. Um, so we have progressed in our thinking. It's not just as, as was once the case, just purely about wheelchair access and mobility access. Um, standards have increased and we are seeing a lot more in terms of um, ageing and cognitive impairments and dementia and so forth. So we, we are progressing and as Carol has said, our expectations are certainly, have certainly increased over that 20 year period. So I hope you're able to take away something from that and I hope we can have a couple of questions from you. Um, gracias, my, my only little bit of Spanish. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much for your presentation. Si queréis hacer preguntas, yo las puedo traducir. Sí, o si las queréis hacer en inglés también. Eh, 
¿Alguna, ¿alguna pregunta? Nadie. Well, thank you. And I just wanted to ask you one question. Uh, can you tell us about transport? How is transport situation in the UK? Okay, I'll, I'll take transport um, because I was on the, the transport advisory body for many years. Um, transport is covered under the Disability Discrimination Act and now the Equality Act, but in a slightly different way and in some, some ways a more effective way. Um, the, the transport vehicles and infrastructure um, is covered by um, requirements that um, they have to meet a certain level of access that is very much monitored for any new bus that comes on, any new train, any new piece of rolling stock. It's very closely monitored. If it doesn't meet the, um, the code of practice on public service vehicles or on rail vehicles, then it doesn't get to operate on our roads or on our things. So quite strict there. Um, there are end dates in sight. Um, there's an end date of 2017. Let's see if we meet it for um, for most public transport. Um, for, bus, for sorry, for most bus local um, bus use, that all the buses operating should meet the. Um, the level of, of accessibility in the published standards and for trains and rolling stock that has been 2020 and there's always moves to move that back um, but if, you know that that has, has really sort of concentrated um, everyone's minds so in terms of the physical structure um, transport is quite well covered the the gap for transport was always the way the service was provided. And, and that was always the difficult part. And that is now covered, and it's, it's covered fairly well now. Um, but when, when the vehicle part was sort of siphoned off to be dealt with differently, the way a service was provided and the way people perhaps were treated on a bus or on a train or buying a ticket, fell through the gap because it wasn't covered in either the building or the transport but um in, so there was a lot of concern about that but that was tidied up um a couple of years later and that is now sorted um in terms of trains we're covered by the probably the same standards as you are which is the uh, the tsi um rail uh, which covers throughout europe <coughs> what happens when we when and if we leave Europe, we have absolutely no idea. We didn't vote for it and, and don't know what's going to happen if it, if it does happen. Um, but for the moment, we're covered you know, with the European standards for rail and um, we have our own British standards for buses and for taxis to a lesser extent. And there are end dates that they're all supposed to meet those. Okay. And also, sorry, yes. I'll just add one more thing in terms of the transport buildings related to that. So the stations and the platforms, etc. There are also particular standards that apply to them that are much more um, strict in terms of they have to have to meet certain standards. A lot more flexibility in the built environment generally than the transport environment. More questions? Okay. Yes. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, we, are, we are very interested now in, uh, in education, on architects' education. Uh, so I would like you to, to build uh, a bit more on your success story and the, the keys no, for, for this. Uh, you, you really managed to put uh, accessibility into into the CV of uh, for architects in, in Britain. Do you want to do that one? Well, they've certainly signed up to it and said that they will do that. So all of the professional bodies that represent 
architects, for example, have said and signed a an agreement that they will do that. Um, it's now time to monitor how they will do that. So um, it was pushed through from national government um, and we can certainly forward you the details of the project um, and send web links to it so that you could read further about it about it but so they haven't some have a lot there are some good examples um, um, but it's still you know it's early days but they have signed up to say yes they will do that so which is good news yeah alguna pregunta más well, uh, I would also like to make you a question. Uh, here in Spain, for example, where when the works are expensive, um, there's a, everybody thinks there must be some grants or public aids, for example, to in installation of lifts. Mm -hmm. It's a, a usual uh, problem. So is there something like that over there, or everything is on charge of the uh, service providers or dwellings? Do you have? Um, it varies. Um, if it is an historic building, and then you may get a grant. You, you're unlikely to get a grant just to put a lift in or just to make the access changes. You would have to be doing something else as well, um, improving the visitor experience or whatever. Um, so you know you might get grants through the arts or through her heritage um, and, and sport. Um, apart from that, no, it, it's considered that it's uh, it's something you're required to do, therefore you're required to pay for it, um, too. I think within local authorities, there, there were, around 2004, some funding streams for very small businesses to enable them or to help them improve um, their premises. So those might be very small local services that you know needed a, a ramp up to the front door, or you know needed some assistance, and there would be in some local authorities, not necessarily all, um, a, a grant you could apply for. Um, those days are gone now. You don't get anything. It's just an expectation that you do it. Um, in, you know, in that way. You got anything to add there? Mm -hmm. I think um, because we knew in ten years in advance that the date of 2004 was coming, um, people were expected to gather their funds and plan for that implementation date. Um, and also, um, it wasn't necessarily the case that everything had to be done in October 2004, on the 1st of October 2004, everything had to be done. It was that you had to have considered this issue, so undertaken an access audit of your environment, know what the barriers are to access, um, and have put in place an action plan so that those things that were low cost could be undertaken through management or maintenance should be done straight away. Um, those things that were going to take a little bit longer had had deadline dates. They knew who was responsible for doing that. If it was a major cost, like installing a lift, that it was considered there was a budget put aside in the future for that. Um, so it wasn't necessarily the case that you know, everything was expected to be done by that date, but that people had taken those issues on board, consulted with their users about what the priorities were, um, and how, not necessarily, so, so the duty was to remove, if possible, alter, if possible, if reasonable, or avoid, so there may may have been an alternative way of providing that service. So if you had, for example, a meeting room on the first floor, it may be that you manage your building so the meeting room comes down to the ground floor, so you have that service in an alternative way until you can install a lift or what, you know, so it was, that was the, the, 
the um, the expectation. Okay, thank you very much. So, if there's no more questions, thank you very much. <laughs>